Hi, I'm Amateur Andrew, and in today's video, I want to talk about the Star of Bethlehem. So this is the time of year, as a pastor, where we start to think, or youth pastor, or whoever, we start to think about um, Bible stories, or Christmas stories. Obviously, we think about Bible stories, because we're, <laughs> we're in the ministry. But, more specifically, about Christmas stories, and so, and every year, you kind of like, I mean, as a Christian, I grew up in the church my whole life, and so... You know, you read these stories over and over again, and so you think, oh, okay, yeah, there's, you know, this is what it says, and yada, yada, yada. But then you really, like, as Scripture does, because you, you never stop learning the Bible. You can't just say, like, oh, I know everything in the Bible, and I don't need to learn anymore. Like, no, every time you open up the Bible, there's just, like, there's just something there that sticks out to you, and the Holy Spirit teaches you. And so, as I was trying to think of a Christmas story, because I did, last year I did prophecies on the Bible, or Christmas prophecies that came true and that was a lot of fun but this year I was like I don't know what to do and then so the first sermon I came up with is what I'm going to be preaching on tomorrow or will have already preached on by whenever this video comes out uh it, it's about the magi and or the wise men and it's it's stuck I really started to think about it because the, the my initial thought was what I would preach on which is because the wise men see the star, and so what do they do? They followed the star, because they knew it signified that the Messiah had been born. And so, my initial theory, or not theory, but teaching, was going to be, okay, well the Magi were paying attention, and so when the star came, they were ready. They were ready to follow, no matter, no matter how long it took, they were going to go see this Messiah. And in the same way, because everything always parallels to where we are in today, you know, with the Old Testament, they're, you know, they're always prophesying the Messiah, the Messiah, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming. And so people are like, okay, is the Messiah ever coming? And so then the Messiah does come, and no one's ready. But these wise men are. Who, and we don't know how many there are. We, you know, obviously, when you look at the nat nativity scene, you always see like three wise men giving gifts, but you don't know. It doesn't say how many there are. They gave them three gifts which is why there's three wise men, but we don't know how many wise men there actually are. It could have been three, could have been two, could have been like 50. You don't know. But whoever these guys are, it's more than likely that they probably came from, I mean, I don't know if it's been proven or not, but as I've always heard, that it's most likely, and it makes the most sense, that the wise men came from, or the magi came from uh, Daniel, because they came from that same area. So Daniel, they probably were students of Daniel, and Daniel did a lot of prophecies on the Messiah, so they understood something big was about to happen, so they were ready. But it's interesting because they come from these eastern lands, right? They're not Jewish, most likely. They come very far away. And so my original, and I am going to preach on this, but the thing that originally stood out was me, oh, well, they were ready. And how in today's age, we need to be ready for Jesus coming back. Because it's the same thing like in the Old Testament where they're sitting around saying, oh, well, is the Messiah coming back? Is the Messiah coming back? And then people get, you know, like, oh, well, he'll come eventually, but probably not in my day. And then Jesus actually does come and no one's ready. In the same way, Jesus is going to come back a second time. And so we need to be ready for him. We need to be, you know, preaching the word, living the word, living the gospel, being a light to our neighbors, to our family, to our friends. And so we want to be ready. We want to be like the wise men who saw the star. They just saw a star and they followed it because they knew what that meant. But, and then I started thinking, what is the point of the star? Because it's interesting. And I said this in the, you know, my reaction, re, uh, my reaction video to the Wendigoon video in the Wendigoon video. Uh, how all the Gospels have a little bit, of, are a little bit different, and that makes sense because they're written by four different individuals. But when you're reading the Gospels, it's important, or at least for me, what I tend to notice is what each Gospel focuses on and what each Gospel doesn't. So if one thing's in a Gospel, it might not be in the next Gospel. And this is a story that's not in any of the other Gospels. It's just here. No one talks about this. And there's a, and then there's a couple of things Matthew talks about that no one else talks about. 
But, and this is one of those stories. And then when you think about like Christmas decorating, like from a Christian perspective, there's always kind of like a star, right? There's a star. That's something that references the star of Bethlehem, but it's only in this story. You could, it's none of the other gospels picked up on it. None of the other gospels talked about the Magi. It's only in Matthew. And then it's also interesting is that when you get to verse three, right? And so I'm talking about, you know, being ready for Christ when he comes back the second time. You get to verse three, right? And this is something else I didn't notice. <clears throat> King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. As was everyone in Jerusalem. And so that part, that's one of those things where I've read over this over and over again, but it never really stuck out to me the next part, everyone in Jerusalem. And so obviously King Herod, crazily corrupt, bad dude, evil man. So obviously he's not happy to hear that, oh, there's a Messiah, there's a King of the Jews, and he's very jealous and he doesn't want anyone to come take his crown. But everyone in Jerusalem, like, what does that mean? Who are they talking about there? And then obviously in verse four, he calls a meeting with these priests and teachers of religious law who will eventually kill this Messiah 33 years later. And so I'm thinking this stands out to me because, you know, another thing that's not true is we imagine the Magi come the same day Jesus is born, right? Like we, like Jesus is a baby and Mary's just kind of holding him like this. And then the mad, like they're in the nativity and the Magi come and they give their gifts. But the Magi come months later, at least they're not there instantly. They might, it may have been a year journey. It may have been a two year journey. We don't know, but it was a long journey. So whatever star they saw really propelled them to go somewhere. It wasn't like they were just like down the road and they saw something in the sky and like, oh, let's check this out. No, it was like they saw something and they made a really long journey, <laughs> like a really long journey. So what would you do if you were a Magi and you see this and you see the King of the Jews and you say the Messiah has come, this King who's going to be King of the Jews. And so where would you go? It's been months later. Where would you go to find this baby? Would you go to Bethlehem? Obviously, they must have known biblical prophecy because where you get the star, and this is my personal theory about why they were looking for a star, is when you go to Numbers 24, I think it's 7, no, 17. It's, yeah, it's 24 17. Balaam's final message, he's prophesying. He says, I see him, but not here and now. I perceive him, but in, in the distant future. A star will rise from Jacob. A scepter will emerge from Israel. It will crush the heads of the Mo of Moab's people, cracking the skulls of people of Sheth. So this is a prophecy of the Messiah, and it mentions a star. And so I think they probably interpret that like, oh, eventually there will be a star. And obviously Magi were astrologers. So stars meant a lot to them. They interpreted signs from them. And so obviously these people put a lot of value in that. So when they see a star, they reacted to it. So your first thing is, uh, your first clue is they say, oh, well, we saw the star as it rose. We have come to worship him. You know, where is this newborn king of the Jews? Like they come in all happy, like, where is this Messiah? Where is this king of the Jews? And then Herod in the first three is like deeply disturbed when he hears this as is everyone in Jerusalem. And so they knew biblical prophecy, obviously. So obviously they knew he had to been born in Bethlehem. But I mean, if a baby, if you thought the king of the Jews had been born, the Messiah had been born, where would you think they had moved him? You would think they would go to Jerusalem because that's the main city. That's like the religious city. You would think Jesus would be in Jerusalem, right? So that's their line of thinking. They're like, okay, we saw the star and we're going to go to Jerusalem. They get to Jerusalem. No one knows what's going on. And then when they find out that there is this newborn king of the Jews, everyone's terrified. No one's excited. <laughs> and there's two theories on this. You know, one is um, with King Herod and when you were changing kings, that wasn't an easy transition. That was usually very bloody. So that was like 
a tumultuous time, so that could be one of the reasons why. But it's all interesting because he immediately calls in a meeting with these priests and teachers of the religious law. And like I said earlier, these are the same people who are going to kill Jesus. These are the same people who are going to get him crucified. So they come into the picture and they tell him where he's at. And so part of me wonders, and I never thought about this before, are these are these priests and teachers of religious law, are they these people? I'm just throwing that out there. I don't know this for a fact. This is just the hypothesis. Were, when they heard the idea, because again, I, this had to have spread around because everyone in Jerusalem had have heard about this somehow, that some king of the Jews had been born, that potentially the Messiah had been born. And so you think that would be like very encouraging. But I wonder, especially when you see the priests and the teachers of religious law, how they act around Jesus, it makes you wonder if they were ever excited about the potential that Messiah was born. Like that immediately offended them, which is a huge context clue, or at least a huge view into their heart that they were always about themselves, which they were. Um, they were always they were always about themselves. They were just about drawing people to themselves and making as much money as they could. So obviously they hated Jesus because Jesus is all about God. Excuse me. But so were they intimidated when Jesus was born? Were they intimidated when they heard, where is the newborn king of the Jews? And so it's interesting too because the reason I'm saying, I'm asking this question because what is the point of the star, right? It's only in this story. So what is it, and like I said in the, my reaction video to Winnegoon, when the Bible leaves something blank, it's intentional. But when the Bible says something, it's intentional, right? So, what is it that Scripture is really trying to show us here? And I think there's so many, I mean, again, there's always so many layers to Scripture. Like, you never stop learning. So, this is kind of like where my head was going. Like, where, what was the point of this? And so, again... These guys, these magi, these wise men, whatever you want to call them, they come from far away. They come from these eastern lands. They come from Persia, right? But here are these, here are the Jews. Here's Jerusalem. And they're asleep. They're not paying attention. They, the star arose. And these people from very far away knew what it, exactly what it meant. But the people there didn't. And so I feel like it's also revealing the hearts of Israel during this. Because you have to remember, from Matthew, right? So, from Matthew to Malachi, or Malachi to Matthew, that's 400 years. That's 400 years of silence. It's 400 years of no prophecies, nothing, just empty, like, silence. And then... All these things start to happen, but people aren't ready. People aren't ready for the Messiah. And that's where John the Baptist comes in because he was to prepare the way because there were people were so dull. They weren't ready to hear the message yet. So they had to have, I don't know why I did that. But so they needed, John the Baptist's purpose was to prepare the way. Because someone needed to prepare the way. Because people weren't ready to hear it yet. And I think you see that here. Where there's this, what you would think would be incredible news. Obviously Herod's not happy. Because Herod's a jerk. And he's like a Bond villain. He's just maniacally evil. But why is everyone in Jerusalem freaking out? You would think this would be super good news be really good news but their hearts weren't ready for it they weren't looking for the messiah they weren't ready for the messiah and that's and so with the whole star thing god that was god's way of speaking to these people because they knew he knew they would get the message and whatever that star is and there's a lot of different theories on that you know but they got the message 
the Messiah is here. The Messiah has been born. And they were ready to go worship the Messiah. But the people in Jerusalem, God's holy city, they weren't ready. They weren't ready for that. And so we can look at that and say, oh, well, you know, the Jews, they weren't ready. How dare they or whatever? No. Even today, we have to be careful because we have the book of Revelation. And so, and again, that's a, there's a lot of things going on in that book that I don't fully understand, but we know it's there. And we know as Christians, we conquer the end because Jesus always wins. And so we've conquered death. We have salvation forever in Jesus. But we need to be ready. And what does that mean? What does being ready mean? It means being, living like living for Christ. Not being asleep to what's happening around us. Because there are signs. There are these, you know, warning signs that something's about to happen. We don't know the exact date or anything. You know, there's a lot of people in churches are like, oh, well, the, uh, the rapture is going to happen in like, you know, next December and this is why, and they'll write a book and they'll make millions on it, on it. And then nothing will ever happen. And then same thing will happen the next year and the same thing will happen the next year and the same thing will happen the next year. No one knows, but we do have the book of revelation. We do have warnings and things we're supposed to pay attention to. That alert us that we are getting closer to that day. Just like the first time Jesus came, there were signs that he was coming. Which the people from the eastern lands, Persia, these magi, wise men, understood. And they were looking. And so, when you really think, and too, when you think about the magi's visit, it caused a lot of havoc. Because... It brought attention to the fact that there was a Messiah. And so they go to worship him. But then Jesus has to escape because Herod finds out that the wise men duped him. Because God says in a dream that they need to go to a different country by a different route. Because Herod's using, he's trying to use them to find him. And so they have to go a whole other way. They can't go back to Herod once they find the baby and tell him where he is. Because he wants to kill him. So, and then this leads to another biblical prophecy of Jesus going to Egypt, which was prophesied. And because God called the son out of Egypt. And so, it's just interesting. Because I never really thought about that. Like, what is the point of the start? And I'm not saying, I'm sure there's a lot of reasons for it. But that was just like the, my main takeaway was the wise men were ready. And the people in God's holy city weren't. These people who aren't God's people were ready, but in Jerusalem they weren't. In the same way, we all need to be ready. Not just the Jews, but the Gentiles, American, Germans, Russians, whatever. We need to be preparing ourselves for when Jesus does come back again. Because we don't know that day. And we don't want to be asleep. And we don't want to be alarmed when it's like, oh, Jesus is coming back in probably like a week. We're like, oh no. We're not ready. <laughs> like We don't want to be alarmed. And so that's... That's kind of my takeaway. I guess, like, my point is... The point of the story, I guess, if I had to... Just put one thing on it, is... It was a sign... That the Messiah had been born... That so many people missed. Except a few. And it's also awesome, because only a few saw it. So God put this sign... This star in the sky for a few people. But it was important enough for him to do that so that they can come see the Messiah. And so I just, I always think that's cool because in ministry, it's always about numbers. Well, it's not supposed to be, but a lot of people get so caught up in numbers and it's like, oh, well, how many people got saved or how many people did you get to your summer camp or how many people you got coming to your church? And it's like, that's not what's important. What's important is reaching the people that God gives you. What's important is loving the people that God gives you. What's important is serving the people that God gives you. So, and we see that in the Bible. I love the story of the Philip and the eunuch, or the Ethiopian, where the Ethiopian, where God sends Philip to go into this desert without any instructions. He just says, go into the desert. He goes in Acts chapter 8, I think. And he says, go in the desert. 
No clues whatsoever. But then he sees somebody coming on a chariot. He's reading the book of Isaiah. And this man doesn't know what he's reading. And so Philip runs up to him and says, Do you understand what you're reading? And he says, No. So Philip tells him what it is. And so the man become, gives his life to Christ and he's saved. Philip baptizes him and then God sends him, <coughs> I'm sorry, sends him somewhere else. And so, but God does all that for one person. And so, when God sees someone who wants to hear him, when God sees someone who's hurting or sees someone who wants to understand, God will make every effort to get to that person. And he'll do whatever it takes. And, he, and with these magi, millions of people missed it. But they saw it, and God knew only a few ever, a million, Sorry, I'm getting tongue tied. My cough's coming back. God knew millions of people would miss it, but he knew they would see it. Because he knew they were looking. And so God still did it. It wasn't about making a big spectacle. It wasn't about making sure, oh, you know, a millions of people saw it. And so that was a really cool sign. No, it was like God spoke to the people who were paying attention. And so that's kind of what I'm taking away. Uh hope you guys have a great Sunday. Uh and thank you so much for the support over the past few days. That's been really incredible to see everyone liking and commenting on the last few videos. Really enjoy the support and really appreciate it. And I uh, hope you guys have a really great Sunday. And uh, I'll see you guys in the next video.